My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the Executive Editor for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Unlocking Business Value Through Data Modeling and Data Architecture, Part 1 of 2. This year's, it's this year's first in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. Then let me give the floor to Megan Jacobs, the webinar organizer from Data Blueprint, to introduce our speaker and today's webinar. Megan. Thanks, Shannon. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Megan Jacobs, and I'm the webinar coordinator here at Data Blueprint. We are so excited that you all found the time to join us for today's webinar on Unlocking Business Value Through Data Modeling and Data Architecture. This is Part 1. As always, a big thank you goes out to Shannon Kemp and Dataversity for hosting us. We will get started in just a few moments after I introduce your speaker and also let you know about some housekeeping items. We are planning a one hour for the presentation, followed by a 30-minute Q&A session. As Shannon already mentioned, due to the large number of participants, we have everyone on mute, but we will be collecting questions via the public chat. Uh, we will try to answer as many questions as time allows at the end, but feel free to submit them as they come up throughout the session. To answer the top two of your most commonly asked questions, yes, you will receive an email with links to download today's materials and any other information you request during the session within the next two business days. Um, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook. We have set up the hashtag DataEd on Twitter. So if you're logged on, feel free to use it in your tweets and submit your questions and comments that way. Uh, we'll keep an eye on the Twitter feed and we'll include answers to those questions in our Q&A towards the end as well. Um, we also want to let you know about a new LinkedIn group, Data Management and Business Intelligence. It is a great place to keep up with in industry news, connect with other data management professionals, and gain access to educational resources. Now let me introduce you to our speaker. Dr. Peter Aiken is an internationally recognized thought leader in the data management field. Many of you already know him and have seen him at conferences nationally and worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions. Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. Peter has written seven books and dozens of articles. He has experience with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as one of the top 10 data management experts in the world. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with organizations as diverse as the U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. He is highly desired at conferences and workshops and always traveling to numerous speaking engagements and projects. Recently, he was in Florida. Peter, where are you today? So today, uh, Virginia, but headed for St. Louis. So uh, looking forward to uh, seeing some of the folks out there, and actually Denver as well. So i uh, got a little bit of a... Uh, tour coming up. Thanks so much, Megan, and uh, Shannon, of course. This is a different webcast for everybody, and I'm going to go not just as fast as I usually do, but very fast. Uh, the goal is to leave you guys with some different ways of thinking about this topic. And as we were putting together this year's focus for the webinars, we really wanted to concentrate on business value. So these seminars are brought to you by Virginia Commonwealth University and Data Blueprint. And this is what most of our colleagues who are not in data management think that data uh, modeling is all about. You get some sort of a vague picture, and you end up with some sort of a uh, you know bunch of things that are pointing in the right direction, but they don't really see the business value that comes out of it. So I'll give you some takeaway points as we do this and uh, pull them back out here. The real goal of a data modeling exercise and any modeling exercise is shared business understanding. We also have to understand that anything that we're doing in order to do most of this uh, is stuff that we're going to be focusing in on highly automated components. And thus it's going to be very clear that we're going to be dependent on successfully engineering these. And if you build your practices on something that has a poor foundation, you will end up with, of course, the usual results. Uh, modeling characteristics change over the course of the analysis. So different parts of your data model that you put together can be used at different phases of your projects as we're going through them. One thing that's real important here, and I, I took this away from, from Clive Finkelstein and John Zachman's guidance, is to use a purpose statement, a motivation component in here as opposed to just a definitional component. Another point that's very important as far as we're all concerned is that the use of modeling in and of itself is much more important than the specific selection of a modeling method. 
uh, in here. So again, the fact that you're applying structured methods is what we're trying to go to. These models are living documents. They need to adapt to change. They're going to evolve over time, and, and particularly as we get into other uh, uh, aspects of development. And these models have to have a modern access uh, Accessibility. They've got to be able to, and I say modern, what we're really looking for is everybody wants a Google search on them. And, and finally, the last component of, of what we're going to talk about today is that utility is paramount. Adding color diagrams and things like that will really help everybody involved in this. And I've got a particularly cute story to tell you on this, one of my own lessons learned in the process. So what we're going to do this hour, again, is start off with, as we usually do, what is data management, what is data modeling, and, and why. But we'll look at the purpose of the excuse me, the power of the purpose statement. And then we'll spend a little bit of time looking how these contribute to organizational challenges that go beyond the traditional data modeling sense, that we can use these techniques to guide problem analysis. In fact, the data analysis, problem analysis, is a, a very useful one that most people just aren't exposed to. Um, and then finally, using data modeling in conjunction with architecture and engineering techniques, as well as business strategy. On this, um, we'll finish up at the top of the hour with some takeaway Q and A, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm looking forward to your reaction on it because much of this material is quite new for all of us uh, involved in this. So let's start with the first one again. What is data management? I throw this picture up. Most people look at it and go, "Yeah, it looks terrible." And we say, of course, we don't show this picture to management. But this is what we mean by data management, and we break it down into five components. First of all. Program coordination, that is, are we all singing off the same sheet of paper? Integration, we're exchanging data from program to program, from part of our organization to another part of our organization, and between our organization and our partners' organizations. We need to share that data across boundaries, but we don't want to be too sharing. And at the same time, we want to make sure we share enough. So it's sort of the Goldilocks. We've got to get it just right. Stewardship, we all have realized up to this point that telling it telling everybody that it's everybody's problem produces zero in the way of results. But the minute it says, Peter Aiken, you're personally responsible for improving the quality of the data in this organization, I and everybody else are now going to pay specific attention to it. Our fifth function then is data development. This is the process of engineering data delivery systems. In the past, this has always meant only databases. And I can't emphasize this point enough. We're in a, a much different environment now, so that even though that's what we've taught you in college and universities, there are now things like XML portals and virtualization that can help in this area and make our engineering problems much, much easier. Finally, our fifth function is data support operations. This is the idea that making sure the databases are up and running and available, the data delivery systems, excuse me, are up and running and available on this. And I've added another chart to this sort of introductory piece here that I'm, I'm labeling after Maslow. And some of you may remember Maslow from your old uh, uh, high school days. The, the basics of the Maslow pyramid are pretty straightforward. If you have food, clothing, and shelter needs that are unmet, then you're very unlikely to use or be able to achieve self-actualization. And yet in data, it's very much the same way. The five basic practice areas that I just described to you provide the foundation on which we need to build everything else that you've heard in data. Cloud, MDM, data mining, analytics, warehousing, so I don't care what it is. If it's on a poor foundation, you will end up anything in the green taking longer, costing more, and not delivering as much as we'd like to do. Finish up this one little section here again. I've taken that first diagram and made it even more complicated. That's a takeaway diagram for you that you can use as a roadmap in order to do this. And all of this is done out of DEMA International in the sense that DEMA International has put together the first body of knowledge in data management area. And it's focused around these things. I know you can, most of you can't read the, the screen that's there. It's a very small diagram. So I encourage you to go to DEMA.org and take a look at it, even download the, um, the graphic yourself. Uh, it's been very, very helpful. We've also improved our certification program as well. There are almost a, uh, excuse me, there are more than 1,000 people worldwide that now have this designation. And this is now, we're starting to see it uh, come out in uh, job categories where people are saying, CDMP preferred. Again, I won't talk about this a whole lot, but if you're interested in it, we'd love to talk to you further about it. The DIMBOK then talks about data development with this particular slide. Again, another very busy slide. It's an IPO diagram, inputs, process, outputs. 
And if you notice, in the middle of the diagram, we have three of the four activities that are labeled modeling or design activities that are there. Uh, so this is what people typically think about in terms of how that goes down. Let's dive into some of the material here. Again, what is data modeling and why do it? Well, we do modeling for a number of reasons. If you were building a house, you would never do it without a sketch. If you were going to have an estimate on how much your new house was going to cost, your sketch gives an idea of how much you're going to be spending on that. If you've hired constructors to build your house, the model is the common language for the project team. If you're going to look at the proposals, you can review these proposals and check the proposals, the models, way before you actually spend a lot of money and then find out things don't actually match up. Um, similarly, if you like the house, Without that model, you can't build it a second time. So the model gives us the ability to implement on the same or different platforms. And finally, there's no way we would drill into any normal wall without knowing what was in the blueprints of that house itself. So again, it makes life much, much easier in this general context. Now, from a data perspective, this means that when we look at database architectures, this is actually foreign to most IT people because they had one course in, in data and they sometimes remember some of the material from it. Um, most people building software are concerned with either program A, program B, or program C, but in this little architecture that I'm showing you here, somebody has decided that A, B, and C should all access the Brown database. And that's a wonderful way of extending some capabilities into the IT world that aren't there in other forms. Now, that looks great, but then what do you have happen when you have the next group of people that come along with D, E, and F? They tend also to build a green database. And right now, we don't know how much overlap is between the brown and the green database, or for the orange database that we put up here. So we end up with a proliferation of these databases. And, and you probably also noticed, too, that this is part one of two. In part two, we're going to talk about this. So this will be the uh, February uh, piece that we do. We're going to talk about how these things flow from an architectural perspective. And you can see, again, our perspective has gone from a single program to a single organization, trying to look at how these things work throughout the entire process. Again, from our architecture perspective, these models allow data to be shared, reduce redundancy, avoid inconsistencies, provide support for transaction, maintain integrity, enforce security, and we can talk about balancing out the various requirements. They also eliminate data dependency, which is a very key piece of if something has to happen before something else happening. Uh, we want to make sure that that does not occur in our database systems. Different users often require different perspectives on the, the data, but our databases keep the physical representation right, changing in line with our organizational needs, but at the same time, we don't necessarily always make changes to the internals, because every time we change the internals, we have to change all the programs connected with it as well. Here's a data model, just as a sort of random one that comes out of the DIMBOK. Uh, here again, what we're seeing is information clearly about accounts, charges, subscribers, and bills. And you can see, again, there's a lot of information on here. This is not a seminar on how to teach you how to do this. We're assuming most of you understand this. But let's talk about the modeling components that go into here. Again, we're defining and analyzing the data requirements and designing data structures that support these requirements as well as support the mission of the organization. So the model represents this component in our environment. It employs standard symbols and things. Again, I mentioned before, we don't really care which one you use. Uh, as long as you're both singing the same language there, if you will, uh, on that. And it gives us this integrated set of specifications that we can now use. Once we have these, we can use data modeling to articulate the data components, and the architecture tells us what models we need to have. So we could have started this with two and gone down to one instead of starting with one and going to two. Again, modeling architecture, they are very, very related. I've already mentioned don't worry about which particular sets you have. Usually that's an organization-wide standard that people use. And the models themselves are useful in standalone mode or as components of a larger information architecture. The models are typically used for purposes of understanding, but the models can also be in the form of equations, simulations, video games, physical models, and mental models. Now, those of you that are falling asleep already, we actually have a polling question for you. And I'll flip it over to Shannon and see what your responses are when we ask the question, what is a data model? A, a framework for understanding and design. B, 
easy to review and validate. C, a structure for organizing things, or D, all of the above? I'll give you a few minutes to answer that question, and uh, let's see what we go. We've got a lot of people answering, Peter. It looks like the majority is saying D, all of the above. Yeah, we Give it just a few more seconds here. It's one of those things. Shannon, one of these days we'll both be in the same city and we'll be able to do it together and watch this together. <laughs> <laughs> you see a different point of it from I do. Well, the poll is closing now, so let me share the results with everyone. Give it a few seconds here to calculate. Doesn't sound like these are going to be surprising to anybody. All right, and there are the results. The majority said D, all of the above. Very good. So let's move on. Again, models, different ways. By the way, I want to give a particular shout out to Ellen Gotson Diner, who did this uh, a number of years ago, but we've used it ever since. Again, the model is making things visible for participants. It's a structure for organizing things. It's a framework for making decisions. It's a tool for doing these things. And you can see all the things that happen in that circle. Now, this is what I want you guys to think about, because when you are faced with any of these types of situations, these models may be useful for you. So, for example, even though it sounds crazy, uh, we've done models, uh, mock-ups of data models on these things when we're talking to business people and they're saying, well, why can't we do it this way? And why, how does it work this way? So the models, all of the things that are on this slide that you're looking at here right now are extremely useful uh, in terms of your daily business operations that you're trying to do it. And you can surreptitiously use these models to also educate your peers about what's going on here. Whoops, I went one too far. Let me back up one. So we use models to store and formalize information. We use them to filter out extraneous detail. The decision to put something on that piece of paper helps us to define an essential set of information uh, that is necessary for the, the, um, the particular operation that you're working on. One of the things I use as an example is a laser pointer that I have. And I always use a green laser pointer. And so I ask the students in my classes, is green an essential set of information for describing Peter's laser pointer? Well, I've told you that for me, I always use a green one. So if it's for some reason necessary that I have green, perhaps I'm colorblind or something, uh, in order to have that particular laser pointer, then it becomes part of my essential set, but it doesn't necessarily become part of everybody else's. These models also help us understand complex behavior. They give us a lot of information just by the process of developing and interacting with the models. And they allow us to evaluate relative scenarios. In fact, if you are not careful about what you do with your modeling, the whole purpose of the term design is to compare two alternatives. And so by that, you should never really create a final data model unless you've created two alternative data models and evaluated the two parts back and forth. Uh, this comes from a great book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's a marvelous book. I'll take you to another piece. But there are two systems in your brain that do this and allow you to help uh, get along with it. Now, the reason I, we're stressing this so much is because when you look at something like what's happening here, and it, for those of you that are seeing the video, it's a quick little video that I'm giving you the full YouTube access that shows how the Chinese construction companies are now able to build a 15, excuse me, a 30-story building in 15 days. And if you don't have these models in place to do this, there is absolutely no way that you will ever be able to develop these models and produce things that quickly. It's a fascinating video to take a look at it. Again, it, it, if you're trying to drive home the point of either modeling or architecture, either one of them, the, the entire building is just a fascinating uh, process that you're looking at. This slide here is a slide I did a couple years back that shows that even when you're working on a single model during a single modeling exercise, there are different activities that you have, different modeling types of cycles that you go through. Uh, for example, in the first bit there, you're doing a lot more collection up front than you are when you're, than you're doing analysis as you finish up that particular piece. Uh, when you're trying to coordinate with people or make sure that people are on board, those are going to decline over time. 
you're going to do what we call target system analysis in many cases, where we're trying to find out what's actually happening in an existing system, perhaps some reverse engineering. And in our modeling process, we're going to start out by largely doing refine, uh, excuse me, largely doing refinement, and then switching to largely doing validation in the long run. Well, the point is, if a model is not validated, it still can be useful in there. So. Hopefully that's enough about modeling. Let's now move on to something here that I've already mentioned once, which is the power of the purpose statement. When you look at a standard modeling tool, it says to you, okay, here's an entity, define it here. And you'll notice the box even says definition. So if I'm defining something that I'm calling bed, then I might get something really enticing like something you sleep in. Well, while that is a, a true definition for a bed, it's probably not the right one for the model. So Clive taught me a long time ago to use, instead of definitions, a purpose statement. And the purpose statement allows you to go a lot further from a motivational perspective than a definition does. Remember our definition, something you sleep in. Okay? Here's the purpose statement. And this is, by the way, a working Veterans Administration system that we built in the early 90s that is still in use today because it was done in the proper fashion. Bed. It is a substructure within a room substructure of the facility location. It contains information about beds in rooms. And everything underlined there is hot text. So we can link to it, go back and forth, and look at the official definitions in there. Again, just focusing on just that purpose statement here, we can see there's a lot more information. In other words, not what is it, but why are we collecting information about it. That allows us then to put in place the modeling components that really do involve a complex process that goes in. A good model is going to accurately express these requirements, but it's also going to be effectively communicated to people. Now, from a modeling perspective, there's really two different formulas. One is the purpose and the audience tells you what the deliverable is going to be. And the other is that the deliverable and the resources and time give you the approach that you're going to take in order to do this. Uh, again, each of them are going to be governed by your own individual processes, but I guarantee you many of you who are listening have been in a situation where somebody's talking about something, and you're saying, look, I, just give me the board for a minute. I want to draw something and sketch it or draw something on the back of a napkin. Uh, this is, again, the process of formalizing, communicating, and also scoping our document. Now, scoping is an important component of this. For some reason, the concept of scoping a document, we used to do this in something that we called a context diagram. And if it was inside the context diagram circle, it was part of the system. And if it was outside, it was not. Well, our scoping pieces have gotten actually very sloppy lately. And for some reason or other, we've stopped teaching this concept of whether something is in the system or not. And so we see in an awful lot of the analysis we do of these failed projects, Scope creep becomes one of the more important variables that goes into this. Now, another way to look at all this, too, is that when you're doing this, don't tell them you're doing modeling. Just write some stuff down, whether it's text on a page or whether you're doing sketches or anything else along those lines. It's perfectly fine to start sketching. A lot of people will do this because the next thing you're going to do is arrange it into some pattern that may make sense to you or may make sense to them, and then make some connections between the objects that you've arranged. Let me give you a very brief example. Again, this is one out of a textbook, but we use it all the time. If we're talking about a soda machine, then we have the things that are going to be playing roles in those soda machines. And you can see that's customer, soda, coins, and machine. And we've drawn them purposely in a sketch fashion. We could do a little more work there and come up with an actual model. It's not a great model, but it certainly tells you some things about the relationship of these objects to each other uh, and how they interact with all of this. In many cases, too, we take that same information and move it on into a larger diagram of some sort or a different form of diagram. In this case, I've changed now the previous one that you saw was a data model. I've taken some of the same entities in there, though, and moved it into a process model so that people can now understand overall how the workings of this soda machine work. Again, just by doing some sketches on a piece of paper and trying to come up with some of these things. Another real important component of all this is that we end up seeing people spending lots and lots of time in meetings trying to figure out what the heck they're supposed to be doing. So I love to have 
meetings where we can sit down and say to people, the purpose of this meeting is to review the voice over IP providers, and the outcome that we want is we want to walk out the door at the end of the hour with the top two proposals selected and schedule presentations from them. Okay, and I've provided a couple of other examples up there for you guys to take a look at. It's something that will help you to get through and understand all of the, the various bits that are going on in there. So as we look at this, keep them focused on the purpose of the models. That house now allows us now to start getting into what are the things we want to get to beyond the traditional data modeling. And one of the tools that most people are familiar with is a CRUD matrix. Now, the CRUD matrix is sort of the holy grail of all of our data modeling artifacts. If we had it properly formed and put out, we would have the perfect, perfect interaction between the various business processes that are on the uh, y-axis, excuse me, the x-axis up there, and the data items that are down on the y-axis. In other words, if I'm going to change business process to second column there, I can see right away that I'm going to also need to involve some changes to data items A, B, and D, and E, and particularly for A, B, and E, which are created by business process too. If I stop producing those items, somebody else further down in the chain will have a problem with it. Now, again, the way we've done these things in the past is that we've assumed that this all worked in either a re-engineering context or a build one from scratch context. But what I'm telling you here is that many, many times as I'm on projects and working with the professional community out there, we'll do a quick and dirty CRUD matrix just to see if we can figure out do we have a good understanding of how everything works. And when people look at something like this, they go, oh, that's marvelous. And then, of course, it tends up on the back of a napkin. So what we want you to do is to keep these and then to maintain them so that at some point somebody's going to start to talk to you about business process 6 and data item F. And once you do that, you're now starting to get reuse of this wonderful metadata that you've put together. The reason you need to do that is because in most of what we do, it's some form of re-engineering today. And I don't mean that in the the old re-engineering the corporation sense, but as an IEEE standard, re-engineering has actually come to mean something very specific. In our forward engineering, we do a bit where we talk about requirements analysis, and that usually ends up in a three-ring binder. Then we do some models in the design component, finally ending up with a physical as-is piece on the right-hand side there. And by the way, if anybody ever tells you that you're going to forklift your data from place A to place B, run. Make sure they don't do that because that's the worst thing you can always do. If they talk about forklifting the stuff, they are missing an important point, which is that you have to understand as you're re-engineering your systems, what are your strengths and weaknesses of your existing system before you go about designing the new system so that you can take advantage of those strengths and avoid the weaknesses. Again, you first reverse engineer your system. So you're going from your physical as-is, that first red arrow, to your logical as-is, and then your logical as-is to your logical to be. That's the second arrow that's on there. You then have to use this information to inform the design of the new system. And again, a forklift is not going to get you there. By the way, if you're going to change your um, requirements as well, you need to go back where the yellow arrows show. That eventually gets you to that green arrow on the right-hand side of the diagram that gets you down there. Now, this has introduced three different types of models here, conceptual, logical, and physical. Again, each of these are a different layer of data model, but these conceptual models are extremely valuable in many cases. Uh, on this. I've got another talk that I'm going to do uh, a little bit later on where we talk about the value and the types of usage in each of these models here. But the idea is, of course, that we want to make sure that users are insulated from changes and that our systems are as flexible and adaptable as possible. Some of you who paid attention in uh, college and university may have actually gotten this down pretty well, physical as is, logical as is, logical to be, <laughs> excuse me, and then physical to be. What this really does is it, it sets up for us a constrained environment for our models. And our models, again, are as is to be conceptual, logical, and physical. And if we throw in one other dimension, validated or not validated, it means that every change that we make to these models is some sort of a transformation in this particular framework. It constrains your environment. <laughs> it allows you now to understand from a modeling perspective how you're doing these. 
this gives you something that we can look again at our strategic level models or something. And we'll finish up with strategy. So you'll see a couple of examples there on that. Tactical level models and operational models. And again, each of these can be important for what we're trying to accomplish because we need to know and understand what's going on with the various data structures that are involved in this. And this gets us into our, our next um, question here, which is sort of an interesting one. We're real curious to see what you guys think uh, uh, about this. But the five basic data structures that we use are a flat file, a index sequential file, a network database, a hierarchical database, and a relational database. Now, there's lots of subcategories of those, but we have a polling question for you guys. And we want to know, from your opinion, how much non-relational database processing is out there. So is it a lot, just a tiny bit, a significant amount, or none? And if you read certain articles and things, you will find that an awful lot of believe, people believe the answer is none. It's so many people believe that, in fact, that they've taken out of textbooks all of this material. So it's a very, very scary proposition. So Shannon, hopefully you're getting some responses out there. Yep, getting it open here. We've got a, people responding. It looks like I said close between A and C. Hmm. Got a few people responding B. I will say we've done some other studies in this area too, and we find out that most people don't even start paying attention to this area until they've been in IT for at least 10 years. Uh, so those of you that are guessing in on C may have uh, some uh, age correlation in there as well. <laughs> All right, let me get just one more second, and the poll is closing. So I can't see the percentages. What were they, if you could read them off to me? Let me, let's, WebEx takes a second here to close, and let me share the results. It looks like... Here we go. She should be able to see now, and it looks like C was the majority. 47%, 32% said A. A. All right, well, good. Uh, again, it's not taught in colleges and universities, but we at DEMA did some surveying on this subject and found out that an awful lot of people are doing this. And let me just tell you how to read this particular diagram. We ask the question, is your organization using non-relational database processing? And 10% of the groups said that they were doing it. And then we said, how much? And they said 25%. And we said, uh, actually, it's closer to 26%. And we said, of that, how much is mission critical? And they said 5% of that 20% was mission critical. So taking away relational databases is one of the things that can be the most harmful, and yet most people besides us in the data management professional community do not even know that these options exist. And what this leads to are some various disasters that you have, where you have a very, very poor foundation that you set up. This is not a scene from New Jersey back at Christmas time uh, in there. Okay, well, let's move on a little bit further here. Let's talk about how problem analysis can be guided by data analysis. Here's a problem, for example, from an IT group that we were working with at one point in time. And I've oversimplified it, but it was an end-of-day processing job that was going on. And it was taking a long time to do. The data would essentially flow into System 1. Some part of it would go from System, excuse me, it would all go to System 2, then some part of it would go from System 2 to System 4, some part from System 2 to System 3, some part of System 4 came back to System 3, so you can see there was a dependency there. And, and then nothing could happen at all until we actually got down to System 6. Uh, again, very complex in terms of this. And what we did is by analyzing this from a data modeling perspective, we did a model of the stuff going into System 1 and a model of the stuff coming out of System 6. And that model allowed us to determine there was very little of business value happening in the middle of that model. So we applied some transformations over top of it and eliminated entire systems that were going on that were working there. And because we had this now system-to-system -system program transformation knowledge that I'm 
talking. It just tells you when it goes into this, make a change from here to here. We were able to store those transformations and manage them instead of in spaghetti code with a, a, a um, you know, requiring somebody's wetware, their brain to figure it out. We actually did generated programs, and we could generate these programs, push them back out there, which meant we didn't have to maintain these things anymore, and we were able to reduce literally hundreds of thousands of lines of code for which the organizations are paying dearly on this. Now, the business value of this is, yeah, we got the end-of-day job to run faster. Okay, that's really nice. But what that really meant was that the organization was able to achieve an entire day in its processing over the competition. So 24 hours lead time allowed these people to translate this into a very large dollar amount in millions and millions of dollars on this. Let me give you the second example on this. There's a, a data structure problem that's sort of a little bit challenging in there. And uh, you know you might look at something like this and say, okay, so what what sort of a data structure is it that we need to have? Now this is the student database master file from one of the application programs that goes on here. And again, you can see from this this model, it's not a very very easy to read model. But if I told you guys it was basically everything hanging off of this student database master, and it was a hierarchical data model. Many of you that are listening to this webinar would be able to go right in. That's enough information to unlock the value that we have there and figure out what's going on. Now, what was interesting about this particular business scenario was that the fellow who wanted to put this new system in place, he thought this was a great place to do this. He thought this was a wonderful package to put in place and, and really able to do a very good job of this. And so we said to them, send us the data model of this proposed system that you're going to replace this with, because this is our starting place. This is our source system. And we want to see what the target system looks like so that we'll know how well this system works. And I swear to you, this is the truth. This model came into us on an 8 and a half, 11 by 11 piece of paper. And you can see there's actually writing in those little boxes there. But they never could tell us, was it a data model, a process model? Turned out it was a data model uh, of the system. And just even looking at this level, hopefully you're looking at this and going, oh my goodness, what a mess. And yes, that's in fact what it was. We were able to entirely dissuade, the, the, in this case, the university that was going to purchase this from buying this on the strength of the lack of the data model map ability components that went into it. Here's our third example in here. Again, here's a query that was running at some point here, Okay, just a sort of random query that somebody was looking at. And you can see there's a lot of dense information in here. Well, these groups didn't understand what we call normalization. Many people call it now harmonization. But it's the idea of making things less complex and putting it into a more flexible and adaptable format. And when we did that flexible and adaptable format, the end result of that original query now looked like this. We were able to go back in and say, hey, here is a way in which we have taken and made more simpler. So again, the business community used to try and figure out these things. And they sure preferred to work on these things, the optimized version of it, instead of the running query that was in there. So those are just three quick examples on, on using problem analysis that is sort of data driven in there. Let's talk a couple of techniques, engineering and architecture techniques as well give some examples that go into there as well. First one is really that most of what we're seeing out there when organizations are going out to buy something, it ends up very much like a one-legged stool. And well, one-legged stools are interesting. They're kind of like the, you know, the, the exercise balls that you, you see in some of the startup companies that you work with uh, on this. It's just not a very stable platform. And our approach is that we see that almost never does a single technology do everything that everybody wants them to, that it's more a interaction of at least three pieces. So in this case, the organization started off wanting to do what they thought was master data management. And it turned out that they didn't pay attention to data quality and data governance at the same time, so that the master data management, while it worked and the technology works, it was a one-legged stool for them. And until we threw the other two pillars of data governance and data quality into play, they weren't able to do this. And we were able to show them this by saying, let's take the data model that you have of the MDM system and see how that would work within a data quality perspective. And it turned out it was a very poor match for it, which meant it was extremely hard to govern, and the group got involved. And more impo most importantly, they had a conversation that they weren't having before. 
There's another similar type example in here. Again, just showing that how all of these three pieces in here, so we've got three pieces of knowledge management practices, master data, and data quality engineering have to routinely exchange data. And I, I say that because they are inextricably intertwined with each other. It's just no way to avoid it. When you do this, again, the data models, high-level sketches of them are all that you're going to need in order to make sure that people know how these things are going to work. Now, I say that at the initial stage, it can be a very high-level conceptual model. Then we might want to develop a logical model so that we're trying to find a piece that will be common to all of these things, and then physically implement it in those three different pieces, which may involve three different databases uh, and things like that. Here's another example, and this one, very interesting. This is another defense department um, exercise in here. Again, if we're looking at this, we say a person can be zero, one, or more employees, and an employee can be zero, one, or more persons. Um, you know, that kind of tech talk where people don't really understand what's going on there. And so the question that comes up, first of all, what are they talking about? And it turns out that the practice that they want to have is something called moonlighting. It's important in this instance for the Defense Department, for our men and women of the armed services, who often work very, very hard for the Army during the day, they need a second job at night. And so they may go work for the Marine Corps. And when they go work for the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps says, you're now a different person than the first person, and their taxes become more complicated. Everything becomes problematic at that point. So the data model here is used to help make sure that we can convey to management and say, hey, if you buy that system, it's going to count Peter as working for the Army as one person and Peter working for the Navy on overtime as a second person. And that's going to complicate the lives of our, our soldiers that are out there, Peter's life in particular, because his taxes won't add up and things like that. And we want to make it easy for them. Here's another example on the same one that has to do with job sharing. Again, a position in the organization can be filled by zero employees, by one employee, or by multiple employees. Well, multiple employees means we need to explicitly support job sharing on this. So I've got this all written out for you on this next slide here again. Uh, the organization has a, a, a set of employees that work multiple jobs, and we need to be able to have that. Or our organization wants to make sure that we can do a flexible work schedule so that we can employ part-time employees on it. Neither of the two proposed solutions would fit this, and the organization would have had to build these capabilities into the system retroactively, which is a big, big problem. Again, it gets into the how much am I going to do in confusion, right, uh, in order to do this, and how much uh, are we going to put in place, and all the rest of the things, versus how much are we going to try to do strictly out of the box uh, in order to do that. Okay, so a couple examples there. Let's talk about business strategy now. And before we get into that, we've got our final polling question here for you guys. So how do data models support strategy in this case? And again, we've got four choices for you here. Flexible and adaptable data structures, cleaner, less complex code, build in future capabilities, or D, all of the above. So Shannon, we'll give them another 30 seconds on the clock. The poll is open, and it looks like an overwhelming majority are choosing D. Yeah, we've got to get better with our polling questions. You guys are pretty smart for this stuff, so no problem. <laughs> Let's not waste their time on this one. Let's move on to the next slide. Yeah, 100% said D. <laughs> oh, man. If I could award you guys all the CDMPs now, that would be fabulous. Hey, maybe we ought to think about that, Shannon. Let's do some online education in that area. <laughs> so back to our topic. How do data models support organizational strategy? Well, first of all, you got to consider the opposite question. Were your systems explicitly designed to be integrated or otherwise work together? And, of course, the answer to that is no. So if they weren't designed to work together, what's the likelihood that they just will work together? And, again, the answer is absolutely no. They are not going to work together. Even if they're explicitly designed to work together, it's going to be problematic. And what we're seeing is 20 to 40 percent of all IT budgets are compensating for this poor data structure integration. The systems can't be helpful to each other as long as the structure is not known, so we need to know some parts of the answer. Now, two, whoops, two answers on that. Uh, first one is that we're trying to get some effectiveness and efficiency goals in play. 
so that we can really understand how we can make the organization easier to run. The second one, though, is that we need to provide the organization the dexterity for rapid implementation. Now, we're doing this on a webinar. When I do this live, I actually stand up on a table in front of the first row of the, the, the audience, and I say, I'm getting ready to do a backflip. And most people go, I'm getting out of your way, because there's no chance that I'm going to do a backflip. I'm not practiced in that art, and it means I am not dexterous in that particular area. People don't understand what that means from an organizational and an IT perspective. So let me give you a little example here. Again, everybody got cleaner, less complex code and things like that. Here's a, a scenario that I ran into during one of the periodic recessions that we hopefully are getting out of now uh, as we're doing it, which is that I was working in a retail situation with a, a group of, of folks. And since they were going into a recession, they said, ah, oh, we're going to have some challenges around this particular piece. All right, so we've got employees, and you'll notice employees can have two different types. They can be either salespersons or they can be managers. And if they're managers, they can be either staff managers or line managers. And yet, just the same way as the previous example talking about employees and having to be duplicated, they told all of their managers that they now had sales quotas to move into. Well, they couldn't figure out how to add a sales field to the manager's category because it wouldn't go through the salesperson processing. So they took everybody as a manager and duplicated them as salespeople. So if I were working for that organization, I would be Peter the manager, and I would get a second alias over there saying, Peter, you're also the salesperson. And they would look at my sales just the same way as they looked at everybody else's sales. Well, of course, the problem there was that when they did that, they didn't realize what the other implications from the model were, which were that I also got paid as a salesperson in addition to being paid as a manager, which, of course, was not what they wanted to happen. So I got a couple paychecks uh, where were paid for 80 hours instead of 40 hours. Now, that's not a happy outcome that can occur. I mean, again, if you don't have this type of structure set up flexibly and adaptably, there is no way you will be able to adapt to changing needs. Let me give you another example of the same kind of thing here, which is that, uh, again, for our university package, we have uh, a, a package that came in at one point in time where they had a fixed number of faculty that could teach any one particular class. Well, the point is you typically think of one faculty member for one class, but oftentimes there are exceptions to that, and do you want to deal with the exceptions programmatically or by exception? And, of course, the answer is you'd like to move as much programmatic stuff into it as possible. It turned out that of our classes, we had many, 15%, uh, I think, that had multiple faculty that were associated with them. So putting a single faculty member with all of our classes was a really, really bad idea. Now let's dive into a little bit more of a strategy component on this as well. So we've got an example here where here's a mission statement. And let me just restart that, make sure that shows up for everybody. Hopefully you can see this. It should say mission and purpose up at the top there. And here's the mission for this particular organization. Uh, develop and deliver and support products and services which satisfy the needs of customers and markets where we can achieve a return on investment of 20% within two years of entering the marketplace. Okay, I'm getting a technical alert signal here. Hang on. Let me do this. I will stop the sharing and start it up again. So let's do that real quick. Hold tight, everybody. And thanks for the feedback. Hey, Don, good to see you. All right, let's try that one more time. Should be slide 69 now. Is that coming through? No, we're still seeing 67. I haven't changed anything. I, don't know I didn't see you there. stop sharing. Very interesting. Sorry, folks, for the technical delay here. Peter, I'm going to um, take Maybe over from you. Yeah, and make, make myself presenter. 
And if you want to stop sharing there, sorry, people. We'll get this going for you again. And I'm going to add you back. Okay, if they were you. Okay. And I'll see if and you can put the slides. Right. Technology is so great when it works. <laughs> Okay, better? I see. Okay, so we see your slides. 69. No. Okay. Okay, good. Great. Again, thanks for the feedback, everybody. So here's our, our mission here. Uh, again, develop, deliver, support products and services which satisfy the needs of customers and markets where we can achieve a return on investment of at least 20% within two years of market entry. Wow, that sounds like a great mission statement. I'd love to work for a company that only makes 20% on investments. <laughs> When you start to do a model analysis on this, you can actually see that some of the things from that statement are things that we can look at from a data modeling perspective. So these are called strategic level data models. Uh, again, Clive's got a couple chapters on his uh, purple book that go over this in a lot more detail. Uh, I'm very fortunate to, to spend some time with him looking at this. And, and notice what we have here. We have the nouns that came out of here. So remember, our statement is, develop, deliver, support products and services. Okay, so we've got the products, and products and services are being counted as one in this particular instance. In markets, so we've got a market piece uh, that satisfy the needs of customers. We've got that, where we can achieve a return on investment. That's performance. And in, our, in order to do the performance, we're going to satisfy the customer needs. So this is sort of a, a start of what that strategic level data model looks like. Right? Now, obviously, this is not much of a model because it doesn't really tell us something that's going on in there, but it at least gives us the major pieces. And notice we've already made a decision. We've decided we're going to combine products and services into one entity that we'll take a look at. Again, those of you that are more advanced data modelers may or may not agree with that particular decision, but that was what was done in this particular case. And these things, just saying they're all related to everything else is not terribly useful. So let's take it up to the next one. What are the goals that we're looking at in here? Well, it turns out there's about nine of them that come to mind real easily. What's the market analysis? What's the market share? Where are we innovating? What's customer satisfaction look like on this? How about product quality and product development? So we're getting the timing and the quality of those things right. What about staff productivity, asset growth, and profitability in general? Again, this is a management scenario that somebody has come up with. And of course, what you're going to see is that all of these things end up mapping onto this mission statement. Now, when you get this kind of a mission statement that comes out in a data model, people kind of go, oh, it's getting icky, right? I mean, I've got you know, goals all over the place and where things related to everything else and, and how does that work? Well, it turns out it's pretty straightforward. When you do that, you end up starting to take a look at what's going on in your areas. And I'm going to do a, a little bit of a build here. And we have markets and needs, but of course that's not really what people want to measure, is it? We want to measure the market needs. So we put an intersecting entity in between those. Same thing with customer and market. And again, we have the customer market that we're trying to achieve in there. We have the needs of the products, and that gives us a product need. We have the market products. Right? Again, you can see this is putting intersecting entities between each of these diffuse entities that we had out there in the first place. And now, instead of measuring markets, we're measuring market needs. Instead of measuring products, we're measuring the products that we've sent to market. Instead of measuring customers, we're measuring the customers that we're marketing to. You get the idea on this uh, in order to, to understand that. Each of these is going to give you a different perspective on it. And again, this is not something that you do in isolation. This is actually stuff that you can do with the business executives. The, the first thing you want to do is sit down and show them why just measuring markets and just measuring needs is not going to achieve your satisfaction uh, on this. Or take it for a subsequent piece to get even more uh, business value out of it. Now what we're looking at specifically is that we're looking at the performance of these various groups. How are they doing? relative to the measures that need to occur there. And that these larger concepts are what then define the types of systems that we need to build. Now, there's nothing that scares me more than going through the airports and seeing all the best companies run software from Software Company X. I'm not going to mention any names. They're, they're all over the place, and each company uh, you know, makes their decisions. But if they're all running the same thing, then their businesses must be all the same. And the only tool they have left to differentiate themselves is the data. 
and that's a, a very scary thought when you look at the performance of how most of these large companies do from a data perspective. A couple points here to, to sort of finish back up on this thing here. Again, takeaways. First of all, virtually any tools are going to help you on this. And again, there's nothing wrong with spreadsheets. There's nothing wrong with PowerPoint on these things. The idea is, are we pulling together the types of things that we need to have in order to get the information across to your customers. And I wanted to make sure I had time to tell you this story. When I was at the Department of Defense, we put together the DOD Enterprise Model. It was a very high-level conceptual model that we were working with. And it was a very interesting feedback session that we had with one of the most senior executives in the Defense Department uh, that was there. Uh, my boss at the time, uh, a fellow named Russ, was showing the model, and and the executive stood up and said, um, Russ, where are the battleships? And Russ answered the question by saying, yes, uh, that the battleships are type entities that float, That's as opposed to the type of entities that, the, that go under the water. Those would be submarines and the things that float. They can have different things on them. They can have, uh, uh, you know, uh, very large guns, and they can launch airplanes and, you know, all sorts of other things. And literally, this executive threw a ruler that stuck in the wall by his head, you know, like doing kind of a thing, and repeated the question louder, where are my blankety-blank battleships? And, of course, the point was taken very, very well by all of us in the room that while we understood the technology components that were important for this, these data models have a bunch of different users. And these users come in different types, and each one of these types definitely needs to see things. One of the most important groups of users that we had for the DOD Enterprise model were a group of people we called general officers. That means they're generals. And as generals, they're not going to understand these lines on the various charts, but they would if we put clip art in them. And the way we solved the problem was when we went over to a type resource entity, we got it so that we could hover over that, and a little bit of clip art would come up and show us examples of the kind of things that they were seeing. And for the final versions of the models that went to these users, we actually handed them the models that had the clip art built right into it so that they were able to look and see directly that this thing had business value. They were able to see directly that there was something that came immediately out of this. So we spent an hour going through a gamut of topics. Believe it or not, that was uh, almost 80 slides we're on at this point. And, and Again, let's just talk about it. So what we're trying to do here is to, to take and wrench open the traditional data modeling mindset that says data models are for building databases. Uh, again, our goal from a modeling perspective is we need to have a shared IT and business understanding. If we don't have that agreement, then we either have insufficient communication or we have a disagreement, neither one of which should be a green light for going ahead with the project. That these data models produce highly automated designs. And these designs have to be in place excuse me, <clears throat> in order to achieve automation. One of the companies we worked with recently was a company that was selling into Amazon. And as they were selling things to Amazon, Amazon has a very set procedure for doing this. When they order something, they want it to be automatic. When it comes back, they want it to be automatic. They don't want to have humans involved. And these guys kept having errors on their part, which caused them to not fulfill and get on Amazon's blacklist. Well, you don't want to end up on Amazon's blacklist because then Amazon doesn't want to talk to you. And again, since it's such a highly automated company, you can see that that has even more problems. Again, the characteristics of the model change over the course of the analysis. Keep all of those versions because you oftentimes discover that some of the versions that you had earlier, they were just simply not refined. It was a level of detail that was appropriate for presenting to managers. Do as much as you can to incorporate motivation into all of your modeling pieces. Uh, again, in Data Blueprint, one of the things we talk about as well is hitting the why component. A lot of people will tell you what they want to sell you and how it's going to work, and those are great. But what we concentrate on is why you're doing this, because why you're doing this is really the key, gives you the insight that goes into that particular piece. Again, in our view, the the selection of doing modeling itself is much more important than the selection of any specific modeling method. So if you get into a holy war where people are arguing about IDEF versus objects and things like that, that's the wrong conversation to take place. 
it's much more important that you all agree on the pictures and then work from there. And that these pictures are living documents, that they do not just stop right at one particular point in time, that they continue to go on and on and on and, on and live through that. That these models have to have these interface technologies. And finally, the last part of this, utility of the model is paramount. I had one CIO that I worked for who said, I don't understand what these data models are, but I know that when I travel to my group in Singapore and find out that they're doing modeling or they're using the models that you produce, I know what you guys are doing is producing good results. So that's the end of the presentation, and now we can go to some questions, and I see we've got a couple good ones out there already. Uh, let me start out with Dave's, because I, I just happened to glimpse that one that was out there. So Dave, you were asking about virtualization. Uh, well, they get the rest of this ready to go. But the virtualization piece is that we have a series of technologies now that lets you do them. You're seeing them come up with the column databases and things like that. It's putting something in memory without actually having to create a file as a result. And that gives you a little bit more flexibility. Uh, the company Metagenics was a big uh, pioneer in that field. They've gotten bought out, and I think they're now called Revolitics or something, but uh, some worth following up. Dave, if that isn't clear, let me know, and we'll, we'll come back to it. And uh, Megan, what other questions do we have here? All right, thank you, Peter. Um, now it's time for Q&A. Time for you guys to ask your questions, so just click on the Q&A chat feature, and you can submit your questions through that chat window. And we've had two come up so far. Let's see, get these rolling. Um, the first question is, do you include spreadsheets in the non-relational? No, good question, uh, excellent question, actually. So when we measured those, we looked specifically and said, are you doing non-relational database processing? So the spreadsheets are another category entirely out of there, and I don't know where that, that goes. Um, if you want to read a great book on spreadsheets, there's a book by a, an HP researcher named Bonnie Nardee called A Small Matter of Programming. It's a tiny little book, but it's a, it'll change your head in terms of what kinds of things that are going on out there with spreadsheets. I can remember at one point I went to an island in the middle of the Pacific, and there was a guy that had a computer that could sort things, and that's all he did all day with his spreadsheets. He sorted things for all the various other uh, people who were working on the island. Uh, Fascinating stuff, to, an entire subculture to dive into on that. Okay, great. And then the um, next question is, uh, why slipping into the FUD? Uh, yes, we know what is in each of these colored repos since we provision and authorize them. I'm sorry, you're going to have to read that question again. Right. What, what do they mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> it says, uh, why slipping into FUD? So FUD is usually fear, doubt, and uncertainty. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe somebody can clarify that particular question there. Okay, we'll see if we get um, any more. Any more on that one? See, here's another one. Um, can you provide a simple definition and explanation for the value of data virtualization in plain English? So I think it was Dave's question. So. Um, oh, yeah. But I, I gave the definition part. The value of virtualization is that because it's virtual, you don't have to actually provide a permanent data structure. And one of the things we as data engineers are trying to do is minimize the occurrence of new data structures. So if we can have temporary data structures that exist for a job and then go away. Uh, remember, the kids these days don't even know what a batch job is. Uh, it's, it's just fascinating to see the way the world has changed. Um, but uh, the virtualization is, is huge because it means you can do stuff in memory as opposed to going to I.O. Uh, it gives you the same kinds of order of magnitude value that NoSQL does, uh, moving, the processing to par moving the processing to the data instead of moving the data to the processing. Uh, again, very, very interesting topics on that. All right, and the next question is, the BED's purpose seems to describe the relationships external to the BED that are subject to change while the BET itself remains static. Is this an accurate observation, and what impact does this have to model development and changes over time? What are the three initials, BED? Yes, BED. Gosh. Basic element definite. I'm not sure what they mean by BED, but let me try to answer the question. Hold up, I'm going to flip back a couple slides here. And I've got some sort of beeping in my ear. I don't know, Shannon, did some switch get flipped or something? I don't know what that was. 
Oh, Robert. All right. So, oh, bed. Okay, there we go. Thanks. <laughs> it was capitalized. There we go. Okay. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> so it's just a bed, Robert. <laughs> Sorry, that was all we were trying to show there. Was it's just a bed. <laughs> Yeah, so, again, our example here is if you just ask for the definition of a bed, somebody's going to give you something smart like, yeah, that's something you sleep in. But if you just instead say, no, what's the purpose of collecting information about beds, now you end up with a better purpose statement that is much richer in terms of its semantic understanding, its ability to connect, its ability to link with existing taxonomies and things than strictly a bed. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Um, Robert, I'm probably going to see you in St. Louis in a week or so, or a couple weeks on that. Megan, what other questions do we have? All right, the next question is, the purpose statement shown included a statement about relationship to other entities. This seems to expose yourself to an update um, anonymously, I guess that's what, um, should the model change? Absolutely, and uh, that's a very, very good point, and uh, we shouldn't minimize that. The purpose statement here in this case is showing that we were able to, and we were using um, a modeling facility at the time that allowed us to put in these hyperlinks on here so that if you change the structure of this, yes, you're absolutely going to have to go back. So the, again, the question is, what problem are you trying to solve by doing the data model? And in this case, this was a new build of, a, of an existing system, but they were putting in so many new features of it, they decided to treat it like a brand new um, build on this. Again, I mentioned it before, it's the Veterans Administration system. So you're absolutely right. If we decided, and by the way, this pointed out a, a problem that we had with this, because when they came up with this particular requirement, right, it's a structure of a room located within a facility location containing information about beds within rooms. What also had to be a room? Well, it turned out they hadn't thought about two things that were also rooms that hadn't been planned to be rooms. One was hallways, and the other were elevators. Now, you wouldn't think of an elevator as being a room, and you wouldn't think of a hallway as being a room, but one of the things they were trying to do with this was to not lose patients. So another requirement was that they were going to put RFIDs on all the beds so they would never lose another patient. And that's probably scary for you, and I hope none of you are going into the hospital tonight, but hospitals do lose patients occasionally, and this was supposed to be their way of solving that particular problem. But again, as, ab absolutely, as, as the questioner points out in here, if you end up with a structure this convoluted and you try to maintain that structure, you have the anomaly problem that, that was pointed out. This would really go into your requirements document and, and more information, but again, what you're doing is you're gathering more information that would normally be gathered in that process by changing it from a definition to a purpose. So be careful. No, you don't want to have to maintain the definitions within the, the substructure of your models, but it is important here because it tells you that bed was going to be a critical way of identifying, in this case, uh, where the patient was at any point in time throughout the hospital stay. Again, great question. Thanks for catching that. All right, and thanks for the question you, questions, you guys. We've had a lot come in. Um, the next question is, is it helpful to link all entities to each other? <laughs> um, okay. Um, I think the answer to that is entities should be linked when they are appropriately linked. I mean, here is a, you know, you can't tell what the structure of that thing is other than it's a mess, and that might give you a little bit more structure. But the point is you only want to link things that should be linked. So when I show this particular linkage, which I'm guessing is where the problem came from, how the question came from, they were all linked because we saw as we were building the strategic level model that we had to do it. But it does not mean that everything will be linked to everything else. No. Uh, if, if you're doing that, you're ending up with a, a mess on your hands. And by the way, you can handle that all with one table, so you know that, that's pretty easy. So no, you do not want to link everything to everything else. You want to link the things that need to be linked to each other in the proper way. And again, the point here is that this model doesn't show you much about strategy, but when you go past that model and now start to look at how we drill down into the next form by putting the goals in place, 
this allows us now to develop a model that is responsive to the business needs by saying, look, you can check market and you can check need all you want, but the piece that the executive needs to have is what does the market need? And that's the reason for connecting those two entities because there is a definite business value need that must occur there in order to occur. I hope that's clear. If it's not, by all means, give us a, a shout and we'll clarify that. All right, great. The next question is, in general, IE or IDES1X is okay for typical static data. Is there a dedicated slash recommended data modeling standard for SOA? No. I love easy questions. Uh, SOA is out in advance of some of this stuff, and it's a place where we as data modelers need to get better at this. But let me, let me not be glib at this, and, and I want to show what the actual question was. So, uh, again, on this slide here, 24, uh, I expressed a couple different types of data modeling languages that we talk about. Information engineering, IDEF, tends to be used in the Defense Department. There's something called object role modeling. Gordon uh, Everest has done some very nice presentations on it. And, uh, of course, a lot of organizations think UML is going to solve all their problems, so they're moving to that. Uh, again, our research shows that it the actual selection of each of those is much less important than the fact that you've decided to approach this in a structured fashion. Uh, and the question specifically was, what works well within SOA? So what you're looking at, the difference there is that in data at rest, which is what the typical data model, as it's being used to develop a database, is created to do, SOA talks about data at movement. And that's a very different piece. And what we've seen actually work very, very well in SOA environments is the scenario that I showed you here where you have these four elements that come up in our data model. So there's our customer soda machine and things like that. And then moving and linking those back over just into a straight process model. And, and that some of the older case tools uh, actually do this very, very well. Integrated process and data modeling tends to work out pretty well from a SOA perspective. One of the key pieces for both SOA and MDM is that you have to have a little bit of expertise in modeling architectures from a process perspective as well as from a data perspective. If you try to do it just from the data perspective, you have a, a mismatch that can occur, which I like to relate to um, my Prius. Um, I have an 05 Prius, and if those of you that aren't familiar with Prii, uh, they have an, a gasoline engine and an electric engine in there. And for years and years, the car companies tried to figure out how to make a car that would get better gas mileage. And they were looking at either electric or gas. And uh, Toyota's Insight, which all the other car companies figured out pretty quickly too, was that the two of them have to switch back and forth in fractions of a second. So literally, as I'm driving, the electric motor will cut off, the gas motor will cut in, the gas motor will cut off, the electric motor will come in, they'll both run at the same time if I need to accelerate very, very quickly. Well, that's a model that people just hadn't considered in the past. But until they got out of that either-or paradigm, they weren't able to see the beauty of having those two engines work in harmony, in integration, which is the way they did. And I hope that analogy translates well into the SOA environment because we see so many people trying to do good things with SOA and messing up because they ignore the process definition side and get the data side correct, or the opposite, they get the process really well and they don't get the data correct. Again, I hope that answers your question. It's a great one. Okay, and the next question is, uh, what is the relationship between data quality and data modeling? How can there be bad data quality if there's no data modeling? How can there be bad data quality if there's no data? Um, I think I know what you're asking here, but let me, let me answer the question the way it's asked. So, so data, of course, is the things that go into the model. It represents an instance of the model. Let me put up here, again, it would be an instance of a customer or a soda or the machine or the coins. Uh, that are on there. Now, when you move into data quality, there's a couple things that are important. Uh, the first one is that there are two types of data quality problems. The first one is what we call um, data uh, processing problems or data challenges that relate to the operational uh, of the system. And that is when you're putting in data and getting it out and things like that. Um, you know, again, just making sure that when you select, uh, you know, grape soda, you actually get a grape soda that comes out of the, the soda machine. Um, the other part of it, though, is that 
most data quality problems have a structural dimension to them as well. And if I had a different data model here uh, that I was showing you and that the that it didn't connect the soda to the coin. That you know there was there's some other things that were not um, that, that were confusing, and it was a, a longer chain of events, I guess, to to get to the soda uh, in there. We couldn't fix that by code, or we could fix it by code, but it would take a long, long time. So when you're dealing with data quality problems, it's important to understand that if you're dealing with a, a surface structural problem, a surface problem. That takes one type of remediation, but if you're dealing with a data structure problem where the data is simply structured incorrectly and you're unable to get to it or have it do what you want, and again, I, can, I can't tell you how many times I've gone on engagements and found organizations suffering from that particular problem, <coughs> Excuse me. It's, it's very important to correct the structural problem with a new data model, including the data architect. Because if you don't correct that structure problem, you're simply embedding a problem in there where you're going to have to always have somebody fixing something uh, every time they want to make a change to this or every time some bad data comes in. The other part of it that's really important, though, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is to understand that from a data structure perspective, we have different areas of leverage that we can put up here. And if you give me a quick second, I can actually pull this one up because I happen to know where that chart is. There, so this is last month's talk, uh, I guess. But maybe it wasn't last month's talk. Uh, when did we do data quality, Megan? Uh, I believe it was October. October, okay. So could be wrong on that. Second here, and I'll find this chart that we find quite quite useful. Here we go. When you're looking at this chart here. You can see that as data is closer to the user, we're dealing with something we call data representation quality, which is how something looks, how it appears, whether the system is propagating it in the right mind. On the right-hand side of this chart, we're dealing with stuff that's closer to the architect. And again, what we're dealing with there are high-level things. Now, the difference here is that on the left-hand side of this chart, you have very little leverage. And on the right-hand side of this chart, you have great amounts of leverage. So you can spend a lot of time fixing problems one at a time as you're dealing with them in data representation quality. But if you fix them at the model and the architecture level on the right-hand side of this diagram, you have much greater leverage. And that leverage will pay off in terms of quicker results for the business. And that's, of course, what we're trying to get to as well. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, again, I don't know when we're going to hit quality coming up here. Is it the second quarter, I think it is? You can do a whole hour on that, whole 90 minutes on that one. Oh, and in fact, uh, that's when we've got Tom Redman coming in, too. So we have a, a good friend, Tom Redman, who's going to uh, do a guest appearance on one of these things here as well and, and uh, can talk to him about those topics as well. Okay, great. And the next question is, uh, what about the NoSQL? You have not put any emphasis on a new paradigm change that would affect the data modeling concepts. That's a great question as well. I didn't actually ignore it. Uh, I did mention in there that there were trade-off analyses that you had to do. And let me go back to one that would perhaps illustrate that. Uh, again, the concepts of NoSQL and big data in general, and by the way, I'm not a, a fan of the term big data. If somebody comes up to you and says big data, I would challenge you to get them to give you a definition of what big data is beyond the value, variety, and velocity kind of things that are not measurable. Uh, on this. But I do like big data techniques, and again, NoSQL plays into that as well. So if we're looking here at an old paradigm on this, and I'm making this up as I go along, so it's not quite as elegant as I'd like it to be, and it, we have these programs that we're trying to do, and they're all trying to access the database, we have some contention issues. We have what we call the von Neumann bottleneck. Uh, again, for those of you that are not familiar, John von Neumann is the person who created the basic computer architecture that really didn't have any significant improvements on until the NoSQL movement came along. Now, in this scenario that I'm showing you here on the screen, program A, program B, and program C all have their data stored in the Brown database. Uh, no problems with that. It tends to work out very, very well. But as program A, B, and C start to get very, very large, they have some contention issues because it does require a lot of processing power to take the data, move it to the processor, get something executed on it. Maybe we're executing a data mining algorithm or a text algorithm or something like that. 
and then push it back. So the whole concept behind NoSQL is to take and take the Brown database and move it out so that we can have these programs go in parallel and hit the data in parallel processing as well. It's a different mode of processing. It's a very powerful advantage, and it requires people to make a trade-off. And the trade-off is we are loosening the database requirements in order to do the data processing requirements more justice. Are there times when you want to do that? Yes, when you're looking for trends, trying to figure out what's going on, uh, you know, doing sort of sentiment analysis and things like that. But do you want your billing records to be done that way? Probably not. So let me give you a very concrete example on that. Many of you are iTunes uh, users, and when you buy something from iTunes, you may have noticed that Apple doesn't send you a receipt right away. They've chosen to de-emphasize the need to have that receipt right away because you actually get the product right away. And when you get the product, that works out much better in most people's minds. Now, Amazon, on the other hand, spends a lot of time and money to make sure that as soon as you click Purchase on Amazon, you get a receipt right away. Different business models, different abilities of the organization, different ways of going and doing business. Is Apple correct and Amazon wrong? No. Is Amazon right and Apple wrong? No. It's what works for the business. So the idea here is to start to spread these things, to eliminate the von Neumann bottleneck, and to start modeling. And now they say, great, if we're doing modeling, if we're doing databases for a different purpose, then the modeling similarly has to evolve. And I've yet to see anybody put a good package together that talks about what modeling looks like in the NoSQL environment. But Shannon, I'm sure you've got a NoSQL conference coming up that might be useful for people to take a look at, right? We do at the end of August. There you go. Hopefully yep. I'll see some of you there on that one. Again, great question. Hopefully I answered it. Okay, great. And it looks like you've answered the next question, so we'll skip that. And next As question is, is, how do you can – Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Prior to that. Um, how do you convince management integrated data architecture is more economical in both the short and long term? Uh, well, I don't know who asked that question, but that is such a good plug for my upcoming book. <laughs> I just – I tell me that's not one of us, right, <laughs> that asked that question. So there's a couple nope. things that are that are important to convince management of in terms of integrated value. And the first one is to understand that most everybody in IT has had exactly one course in data over the course of their education. And that course in data taught them how to build new databases. So if management understands that data is about building new databases, they've got to understand that they don't have the knowledge, skills, and abilities on their IT staff to do or take advantage of the integrated data architecture that you talk about. The second thing that you need to convince them of is that management uh, cannot ever fit data into Agile or any other software development lifecycle model. It does not work. It is external to the software development lifecycle. The software development lifecycle is specifically set up to create something where nothing exists. The data evolution lifecycle takes your data which persists and talks about evolving it. And that was the chart that I showed you here uh, on that particular one. There we go. Uh, if management is unwilling to buy into those two points, they're unwilling to get the rest of the, the story that goes on. I've got, uh, like I said, a, a small book that's due out, and we're doing that one in April, is it, Megan, on that topic? I I'm believe sorry, so. I don't have a schedule in front of me. And, and we're also bringing in the uh, former CDO of the state of Colorado, a colleague, Micheline Casey, to talk about that. So we'll spend a good uh, almost three hours that, uh, that month talking about these topics. Uh, so again, hopefully it'll be something you'll be interested to turn in and, and more importantly help us with our arguments because we may not have thought of all the good arguments. But those are two good ones. First one is that your IT shop doesn't have any education in how to do this. And I don't mean that as a bad thing. I'm a college professor. We don't teach you how to do this. So they're not, they're not, they shouldn't be expected to know it. But because they've never gotten any education in that area, it's going to be a hard sell to get it up there. Uh, and secondly, Data development is not part of the software development life cycle or the system development life cycle. And anybody that tries to make it in there is doomed to achieve the same results we've already gotten. And we know what the definition of repeating the same process and expecting different results is. That's insanity. 
So okay. Maybe and the next tell question. Tell me who asked that question so I can find out if they plugged the book or not on that. <laughs> All righty. Uh, the next question is, uh, person versus employee, I thought I saw that a single person could be employed many times, either concurrently or linearly. There would only be a single person, as far as I could tell. True? In this instance, for this model, yes. So the definition of a person, and by the way, you know, I'm, I'm doing a cardinal sin on all these talks, which is that I'm not showing you the definitions for the entities as I'm showing you the diagrams, which is, uh, as you all know, is Data Modeling 101. You should never do that. But yes, a person in this instance, a member of the armed forces, can be an employee, or they can be no employee, or they can be multiple employees. And that makes identity management much easier in this system than it does in the system that requires you to be a different person every time you are an employee. So you have your day job and your night job, right? And then you have to reconcile the tax records on your own at the end. Okay, and the next question is, um, I'm being told by class modelers that LDMs are not needed. Do you agree with that? <laughs> um, it's very interesting. Uh, I don't want to, to absolutely say yes or no because your situation may be, that may be the right answer for your situation. The way we see it, though, is that actually the LDMs, and, and the LDM is the logical data model, are the models that are the most important models that we're seeing out there. Um, so I, I think in general disagree with who's giving you the advice, but as I said, there may be some very specific reasons for doing it that way. Let's just briefly take a look here. Again, conceptual models, logical, and physical models are the three types that we talk about. The physical model is what actually makes your database, and that has no interest whatsoever in most of your business people. If you want to do business value, it's going to be a logical model, and that logical model is the one where things happen at, that the users can recognize. Now, let me give you a, a, a way in which I like to approach these things. Um, Basically, if you start to maintain your logical model and you have the right case tool, okay, computer-aided software engineering or, or systems engineering tools, depending on how you like to define them, that case tool will, in general, generate your physical models for you. So in other words, you say, make me one of those in Oracle and make me one of those in DB2, and the case tools know how to crank out that stuff automatically, which means your logical model is where you do your maintenance. You change the logical model, and it produces for you a new physical model. Anybody that's trying to do it the other way is spending a lot of time doing some things that uh, really we've got machines that do them very, very well, software that does them very, very well in today's environment. So the way I like to present this is the logical model is where I like to do my maintenance. I push an upward from that logical model to get a conceptual model, and I generate downwards to get the physical model. And that's, that's the way I prefer to do it. Now, one more piece to this as well. <coughs> if you're thinking about connecting things, and again, I'm sorry I'm jumping around here in the presentation, but I really enjoy the dialogue uh, that we have on these things. And I'm working on getting all three of these systems integrated, the red, excuse me, the brown, the green, and the, the orange that are on here. In order to do that from a logical perspective, nobody is going to look at each of these systems individually from the business side because it's going to say things like Oracle and column and key and primary and all that sort of stuff and things that the business users don't know or understand or care about. But if I want to make a logical model that describes all of these things here, now I can obtain reusability. I cannot get reusability at the physical level, but I can get reusability at the logical level because the business user is going to come in and go, oh, I see, brown, orange, and green are doing exactly the same thing that purple is doing over here in this other organization. Couldn't we just get purple to do all of that? And that's where you have this big aha and discover that you can eliminate entire classes of processing and entire systems from what it is that you're working on. Again, great question. Uh, I hope that answered it. If it didn't, please ask again. All right, and it looks like we're, we've ran out of time. Uh, if we did not get to your question today, uh, we will get it answered, and it will be included in the follow-up materials and an email and two business days. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating in today's event. We hope you have enjoyed it. Thanks again to Dataversity and Shannon for hosting us. Once again, you will receive today's materials within the next two business days. Uh, our webinar next month will be Unlocking Business Value Through Data Modeling and Data Architecture. This is part two. 
Um, hopefully you'll be able to join us for that as well. As always, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you. Another great presentation, and thanks to everybody for all the fantastic questions. I just love it that so many came in. Everyone have a great day.